Prime Matters, in collaboration with Slaking Thirst's podcast, presents the Christian mythic narrative, The Deep History of the World. PrimeMatters.com is a groundbreaking project of educational outreach of the University of Mary, awakening the Catholic imaginative vision. Episode 1, Introduction How boring is your life? How often do you get bored? Do you find yourself trying to escape into distraction? The 20th century psychiatrist and novelist Walker Percy, an agnostic who became a Catholic and then a Benedictine oblate, wrote a book in 1983 titled Lost in the Cosmos, the last self-help book. In it, he defines boredom as the self being stuffed with itself. He says that in the conditions under which a human being becomes bored, a dog just goes to sleep. And he notes, hauntingly, that the very word boredom didn't even enter our vocabulary until the 18th century. Percy goes on to conduct a clever thought experiment. Here it is from the beginning of Lost in the Cosmos. Imagine you are a member of a tour visiting Greece. The group goes to the Parthenon. It is a bore. Few people even bother to look. It looked better in the brochure. So people take half a look, mostly take pictures, Remark on serious erosion by acid rain. You are puzzled. Why should one of the glories and fonts of Western civilization, viewed under pleasant conditions, good weather, good hotel room, good food, good guide, be a bore? Now, imagine under what set of circumstances a viewing of the Parthenon would not be a bore. For example, you are a NATO colonel defending Greece against a Soviet assault. You are in a bunker in downtown Athens, binoculars propped up on sandbags. It is dawn. A medium-range missile attack is underway. Half a million Greeks are dead. Two missiles bracket the Parthenon. The next will surely be a hit. Between columns of smoke, a ray of golden light catches the portico. Are you bored? Can you see the Parthenon? <laughs> Notice the difference here between conceiving of one's life as a tourist or as a soldier. We're bored because we are comfortable. And we were not made for comfort. We were made for greatness. The world tells us that our lives are a neutral place, a kind of playground or field of opportunity that awaits our activity and that we can mold and shape as we wish. Human life should be a peaceful, reasonably happy, fairly uneventful experience, characterized by interesting times with friends, family, job, vacations, hobbies, photographs of our food on social media. But what if we were not made for such mediocrity? What if we were made for an epic life, a life of bracing and stern adventure, filled with a sense of a calling from beyond the everlasting hills, a calling to self-sacrifice, friendship and lasting intimacy, joy? What if the greatest of the adventure stories were dust and ashes compared to the lives for which we were created? The Christian mythic narrative is quite simply the greatest story ever told. It is the greatest of dramas, with the greatest plot, the greatest of all protagonists, the most wicked of all enemies, and the greatest ending ever imagined. And best of all, it's all true. It is, as C.S. Lewis once said, the myth that gives life, since it is the myth that became fact. Unfortunately, many people do not have a complete sense of this narrative. The view that they have is narrow and dull and bland. Christianity, been there, done that, moving on. Lewis's friend Dorothy Sayers once wrote, Official Christianity has been having what is known as bad press. We are constantly assured that the churches are empty because preachers insist too much upon doctrine, dull dogma, as people call it. The fact is quite the opposite. It is the neglect of dogma that makes for dullness. The Christian faith is the most exciting drama that ever staggered the imagination of man, and the dogma 
is the drama. That drama is summarized quite clearly in the creeds of the church. And if we think it dull, it is because we either have never really read those amazing documents or have recited them so often and so mechanically as to have lost all sense of their meaning. The plot pivots upon a single character, and the whole action is the answer to a central problem. What think ye of Christ? Now, we may call that doctrine exhilarating, or we may call it devastating. We may call it revelation, or we may call it rubbish. But if we call it dull, then words have no meaning at all. Any journalist, hearing of it for the first time, would recognize it as news. Those who did hear it for the first time actually called it news, good news, though we are likely to forget that the word gospel ever meant something so sensational. We may call Christianity exhilarating, or we may call it devastating. We may call it revelation, or we may call it rubbish. But if we call it dull, then words have no meaning at all. In this audio project, we offer a series of reflections that amount to telling the Christian story from start to finish, not from Bethlehem to Calvary, but from the heart of God to creation, to the fall, through the rescue mission of Israel, the covenants, the prophets, the kings, the promises, the Christ, and the epic battle that he waged for us all the way up to the present moment. This series is aimed at widening this vision to the widest, grandest, most mythic scale possible. It will fan the flames of faith in you as the big picture, what God has done and what God is doing, comes into focus. So where should we start? Let's start with this word, myth. As soon as the word myth is brought forward, a problem arises. In modern speech, myth usually means a story that is not true. The tales of the gods and goddesses of Greece and Rome, for example, are myths. They are enchanting stories that no one believes today. A controversial work of theology published in the 1970s entitled The Myth of God Incarnate involved a group of modern scholars who attempted to show that the divinity of Jesus was just a mirage. This understanding of the word myth is a leftover from our unbelieving 19th century ancestors who held that pretty much anything that had to do with the supernatural world could not be true. Since myth is the language that humans have always used to express their understanding of the supernatural cosmic narrative, those who deny the existence of any such narrative use the word myth to mean an untrue account. But this is a reversal of the real meaning of the word. For those who hand on myth, as opposed to those who study other people's myth, like dead insects, myth is a form of truth. And it is the most effective and most true way of speaking about certain aspects of existence. In this series on the Christian mythic narrative, we are assuming that myth does not mean false story. We hold instead that myth means meaningful story, an overall narrative that makes sense of existence. We think that a given myth, like a particular religion, may be true or false, or likely, as in most religions, a mixture of truth and falsehood. Those who hold to a given myth, like those who believe in a religion, always think it to express important truths. We make the claim that every individual and every collective group of humans necessarily goes forward in life under the influence of some kind of mythic story. Our mythic picture of the world is our understanding of the narrative we are living and the meaning of that narrative for our day-to-day -day existence and for our ultimate destiny. Humans are inveterate, meaning-seeking beings, and because of this, we are indefatigable myth-makers. We gain meaning for our lives by understanding the story we are in and the part we are playing in that story. We refer to that narrative in order to assess our progress and to understand our identity. We simply cannot function without such a cosmic story. If our mythic picture of the world goes into serious crisis, so do we. And if we cannot resolve the crisis, we either end our lives or stupefy ourselves with addictive distractions. 
Even those who say they have abandoned all narratives and have left behind all meta-stories have not really done so. They have only constructed myths of negation and revolt. There is simply no doing away with such narratives of meaning. Given this, it is perhaps not surprising that God's revelation to the human race comes largely in the form of a story, a salvation history. God did not save humanity by giving us a set of philosophical axioms or by establishing centers of scientific data, however true or useful such things may be. Instead, he told a story. He authored a story in which he and we are characters, a story with a beginning and an end, with narrative structure and movement, a story in which we have a serious part to play, one that casts light on the mysteries of human existence and that tells us who we are. There is something fitting in the narrative nature of the Christian faith. Humans have always loved stories. Great narratives have dominated our imaginations from the poems of Homer and the Icelandic stories to more recent examples like Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, the Star Wars saga, the Harry Potter series, and the constant stream of Marvel superhero tales. We're drawn to drama because we were made for stories, because we're living in the midst of a story, because we know that everything for us depends individually and for the human race as a whole on the outcome of the story in which we find ourselves. Much of what it means to be converted in mind to Christianity is to understand and embrace the Christian narrative, the true cosmic story within which each individual human life can find meaning and direction. Our current age has devised myths of its own, narratives of meaning that have become so prevalent that they are assumed by many of us as self-evident. The modern progressive narrative inhabits our atmosphere. We take it in through our pores. Part of the challenge for modern Christians is that we are attempting to live the Christian life amid a culture that has abandoned the Christian story and has replaced it with a different narrative, one that is intrinsically hostile to Christianity. Many who call themselves Christian have consciously, if incoherently, adopted the modern progressive myth, even as they continue to use categories and language that come from Christianity. Many others, believing Christians, have been deeply affected by the modern myth story without realizing how much it has shaped their identity and their understanding of the world. The goal of this series is to present an account of the Christian cosmic narrative in its broad outlines and its dramatic sweep, such that it can be embraced or rejected authentically. It is good to remember that Christianity is a historical religion. This means more than to note that Christianity arose at a given time among a particular group of people, or that it has left its mark in historical record. The same could be said of all religions. To say that Christianity is historical means that the Christian religion, like the Jewish faith out of which it sprung and upon which it depends, is necessarily founded on specific historical events. Christianity is not an escape from time. It is rather a redemption through time and history. We can see the significance of this historical quality if we compare Christianity with other significant religious traditions and pose certain historical questions of them. If it could be shown beyond reasonable doubt that the figure of Buddha was legendary and never existed, what would happen to Buddhism? Probably not much. The Buddhist religion would not be significantly affected. Buddha introduced a path of spiritual wisdom to his followers. Whatever his qualities as a person, the path itself is the essential element and would remain intact even if its origins were unclear. What is true of Buddhism is yet more decidedly true of Hinduism. There is no great founder of the Hindu religion upon whose actions its beliefs rest. The same quality marks all the great religious philosophies. Confucius, Plato, Lao Tzu and Zeno were remarkable people, and we're interested in whatever we can find out about them, about what they said and how they lived. Still, the philosophies they put forward would lose nothing of their grandeur and wisdom, even if little were known of their founders. 
But what happens when we ask the same question of Christianity? What if it were proven that Jesus of Nazareth had never lived or had never risen from the dead? Such a discovery would destroy the Christian faith. If Christ has not been raised, wrote Paul to the Corinthians, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. The strength or weakness of the Christian claim depends on the reliability of its history. The historical aspect of Christianity is important because it has momentous consequences concerning the Christian account of reality. Christianity is not fundamentally a philosophy, though Christians have developed impressive philosophic systems. It is not mainly a code of ethics, though the Christian faith clarifies the moral order and makes serious demands on its followers. It is not primarily a practical plan for the betterment of the existing world, although Christians have had much to say about that. At its heart, Christianity is an epic adventure, a high romance, one whose hero and primary actor is God, and one that has implications of infinite importance for every person living. As C.S. Lewis put it, the heart of Christianity is a myth which is also a fact. It is historical and it is mythical at the same time. The scriptures, written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit by the Old and New Testament Church, which is the pillar and ground of truth, and interpreted with ever-deepening understanding by the Church through the years, is the narrative's irreplaceable foundation. Beyond the scriptures, certain interpretive voices from the tradition have been tapped for the construction of this account as characteristic of the way this story has been told through the years. Among others, you will hear from Irenaeus of Lyon, Athanasius of Alexandria, Gregory of Nyssa, Augustine of Hippo, John Damascene, Thomas Aquinas, Blaise Pascal, John Henry Newman, G.K. Chesterton, and Joseph Ratzinger. The narrative given here follows the scriptures and the great tradition, and so in its broad lines repeats the story Christians have received and handed on from the beginning. But the specifics of how this magnificent tale is told in tone, emphasis, and completeness can differ for many reasons. John the Evangelist wrote that all the books in the world could not contain what Jesus said and did. And since his time, the world has been filled with books, examining every aspect of the Christian narrative from every possible point of view. Friends, Christianity is the most thrilling story ever seriously believed by large numbers of people over long periods of time. We may run into someone who says, I see what Christians think. I see what they hope and they believe. I feel the power of the Christian narrative. I understand its attraction. I can see why so many people through the ages have risked everything for it and have based their whole lives upon it. But I haven't embraced it because I haven't found my way to believing that the story of the Christians is true. In such a case, we know we are dealing with a sensible person holding a reasonable position. But if we meet someone who says the problem with Christianity is that it is colorless, boring, humdrum, and conventional, I'm personally looking for something that's more interesting, more elevating, more inspiring, something richer and more gripping. If we run into someone who says that, then we know we are dealing with someone who is ignorant of Christianity and has never heard its account of reality. Sadly, many Christians are themselves in this ignorant state. So an important task for all Christians is to understand the Christian story, to see the broad lines of the great drama into which we have been born and in which we have been assigned a momentous part to play. Let's turn to that drama now, the Christian mythic narrative.